May 11th, 1985, it's Minneapolis, and uh, I'm seated across the table from Charlie Rouse. Charlie, um, there was a long series of one-nighters and tours with one of the legendary bands, Billy Eckstein, and you were associated with a great group. What a what colleagues? Yeah, yes, it was. They had, uh, gee, abundance of uh, great talents there. I, in fact, I was sitting next to Charlie Parker, and uh, Dizzy Gillespie was in the band, Ted Damron, uh, Gail Brockman, Art Blakey, uh, gee, Leo Parker, John Jackson, Lucky Thompson. I was just all the greats was there. Yeah. <laughs> well, that uh, formidable crew, uh, you named them. Uh, how about a comment about each one as you observed them? You were a young man, yes. so were they, yes. and you were young lions, uh, and your uh, ambition, uh, your objectives, uh, and everything, uh, I'm sure, was uh, chemically just tuned because you uh, you know each one of you inspired each other yeah well at the time I uh, when I joined the band I just left school and uh, how I happened to join the band I well before I left uh, Washington I was working in a little club called the Caverns Krista Caverns and the piano player the band leader was the piano player named John Malachi and uh, Tommy Potter bass player and they were we all were in the band at the time at the Crystal Cabins. They all from Washington. And O. C. Johnson was in the band too, the drummer that passed away. And uh <coughs> Billy had left the band. Billy had left Billy Eckstein had left Earl Hines band and formed a big band. And he had gotten t uh he asked John Malika to form uh, to to be in the band. So they were out on the road for about two or three months and uh, it was during the war time. And Crump, uh, the saxophone player that uh, was with Earl Hines, in fact, all the members of Billy Eckstein's band were originally from Earl Hines' band, and they all left when Billy left. And uh, so when the Army grabbed uh, the saxophone player, the Crump, and so they were looking for another uh, tenor saxophone player, and so John uh, recommended me to go and uh, when they called me up, I was so elated and scared. <laughs> and uh, I joined the band in, uh, in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, soon I uh, got off the bus, they met me. And the first night that uh, we were playing a lot of one-nighters dance uh, uh, halls. And uh, when I... Uh, sat down, I sat down next to Charlie Parker, and uh, he was such a warm individual. He pat me on the shoulder and said, everything is going to be all right. <laughs> and uh, it was just a wonderful feeling. Uh, Dizzy was in, uh, this was like, say, a traveling school, musical school. We used to play the dances, one-nighters, and after we get through, we get on the bus, and we still play on the bus. Or when we get to the hotel, we go to each other's room and start practicing and jamming together. And that went on continuously. Your, uh, your memories of uh, Dizzy Gillespie's uh, uh, attitude and direction at that time? Well, Dizzy was, uh, was befriended me. He was a very good... Uh, he took me, like, say, uh, sort of under his wings. He was like the musical director of the group at the time, of Billy's band, Big Man. He would rehearse the band and get the music together. And in fact, he was, uh, he was uh, sort of like tutoring Billy Eckstein with the trumpet. Billy just was trying to play the trumpet. And, uh, well, he's just, uh, he, talked to me and uh, he knew that I had just come out of school and and that I was a little nervous <laughs> so he he uh, he was was like a big brother to me really and what happened uh, 
I left the band after a year. I left the band in Chicago, and Dizzy and Bird was leaving the band right after me. So Dizzy told me that uh, he's going to form a big band when he could go back to New York. And he said, when I hear about it, come up and because uh, he knew I was from Washington, come up to New York and try out for the band. So I told him, all right. So that's how I got to be with Dizzy's big band. And that was a uh, uh, that was a lot of good talent in that band too. Max Roach was in that band. Kenny Durham was in that band. Uh, Benny Harris was in that band. I, in fact, Charlie Parker was in the band, the first Dizzy's band. Then he uh, he didn't travel on the road with Dizzy, but when we were playing at the theaters, like the Apollo Theater, and uh, it was a theater in the Bronx that they used to have music. Uh, Bird used to uh, play with the band. Uh, your uh, your observations uh, of uh, Charlie Parker? Well, he was one of my idols. I really adore him. He was like my measuring stick, you know, because he was so um, far as expressing yourself in improvisation. I thought he could do that as well as anyone, you know, and... Um, his uh, approach to the music. He used to, uh, I'm sitting next to him in the big band and Billy's band. I remember one one night, I think we were in, uh, where were we? I think we were in Fort Worth, either Fort Worth or Dallas, that uh, they had left the music. They have left, they left uh, Charlie Park, they left the first alto book and uh, I think a couple of the trumpet books in the the, the previous uh, uh, one nighter that we uh, played. The one of the um, the the band boy he le left some of the music. So when we got to the job, uh, Charlie Parker didn't have his uh, his book. So uh, we went on, and uh, you could never tell it. He played everything by he could he, he just played everything by heart, you know, by ear, and it was amazing. I just. <laughs> I couldn't understand it, you know, because I never seen anyone do, you know, do anything like that. And I knew that the the book we had a large book, you know, and Billy Eckstein, what he did, he just called everything regular, is uh, like nothing has happened. And uh, just Charlie Parker, and he was playing first alto at the time. He just played everything. <laughs> that must have been a remarkable uh, illustration of a learning process. Uh, how did that uh, really influence you? Well, that, it, it really influenced me uh, in a way that um, I got to be very, um, not uh, critical of myself, but I, uh, I was trying so very hard for per perfection, like, because I saw it in, in, in the uh, talent of Charlie Parker and Dizzy, you know. It, 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 the competitiveness, the, uh, the the company that I was around made me, uh, just made me uh, try harder, you know, to, to, to keep up with it, with, with that particular uh, company that I was with. I was uh, fortunate to be with Fast Company all my uh, music career. I'm sure that it must have had great influence on how you attack things rhythmically as well as harmonically. Yes, true. Uh, well, Thelonious uh, taught me a lot about that, that rhythmically, because he was uh, very rhythm conscious, Thelonious. He would play tempos like in between tempos, like usually musicians would play slow, medium, or fast. Thelonious would choose a tempo in between of slow and medium. And it's, uh, when you start playing like that, you have another approach to the music. You have to approach it another way. And he really taught me how to uh, imagine dealing with space, you know, and, uh, and that was, he was the master in that, Thelonious was. And there, uh, th there was the contrast between uh, Monk and, say, the Eckstein or Gillespie band. Oh, yeah, well, Thelonious was like an individual. Even, uh, uh, well, uh, I know that every musician that wa was around Thelonious and worked with him they learned something from him. He was like one of those unique individuals that uh, he would challenge every individual around him. Like, And that include Dizzy Gillespie, 
Charlie Parker, Max Roach, and all of them. They learn a lot from Thelonious. Charlie Rouse, uh, let's talk about uh, Thelonious Monk in our next conversation and continue this in just a moment. All right. <laughs> May 11th, uh, 1985. Charlie Ross, uh, looking back uh, in time, we go to the uh, real, uh, as Milt Jackson called it, um, the Harvard School of Music, uh, Minton's. Minton's, yeah, that was really uh, one of the uh, high points of uh, the modern jazz in the uh, 30s and 40s. I, I arrived in uh, New York in 43, between 42 and 1942 and 1943. And uh, Mittens was uh, really in high gear at the time. Musicians would be playing downtown at the uh, Paramount and they would play um, until, I imagine the, the theater closed around 10 or 11 o'clock and then they would shoot right uptown to Minton's on 18th Street and it would be there and jam up until 4 o'clock in the morning. And that was going on continuously every day, every night. You had mentioned uh, earlier in a conversation that uh, you'd heard about uh, this remarkable pianist uh, and uh, we touched on the influences and the way he changed your approach to playing and uh, versus the big band and the small group and uh, he was that legend Thelonious yeah. Monk. Where did you meet him? Well I met him in New York when I first came there but Thelonious had played in um, uh, well see Thelonious wasn't born in New York he was born in uh, North Carolina but he came to New York a very early age I think he was around four or five years old so um, when I was, uh, before I left Washington, I heard about Minton's. And that was during the time when Thelonious was there. He was like a house trio there. It was him and Kenny Clark and Oscar Pettifoot. And so well, that's, that's when they, it really started. When I got there, it was, uh, it was just at a high, uh, high gear at the time. But it, four or five years previous to that, that's when the, uh, the music they called bebop, they were calling it modern jazz then because uh, the music was changing at that period. And that's when uh, Thelonious and Oscar Pettifoot and, and uh, Kenny Clark, they had the trio. And that's when everybody was there. Uh, Charlie Christen from Benny, Benny Goodman's band. Everybody that was working in the theater or was coming through town, they would wind up going to Minton's, jamming all night and playing all night. Uh, I remember well Bud Powell, everybody, all the musicians. That would that was the club to really play. Uh, Monroe Uptown it was a nice club too, but it was like an after-hour club, more like. But uh, Mittens was really the uh, the main source of uh, inspiration and <laughs> the main source of uh, hearing really good music. The uh, all the greats was there, and then you have to you really have to play when you. Um, get on the stand in Minton's uh, during that time. Because like if you are not sure of yourself or you you were like uh, uh, messing up a little bit on your horn, the musician would walk off the stand and leave you up there alone. So you would really have to uh, know what you're doing when you got up there playing. In other words, you had to bail yourself out if you got into uh, one of those pockets or holes. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> and nobody would try to help you out. They would just walk off the stand, you know, and they say, well, you have to go home and study a little more before you come out and play. Let's talk about the inspiration. You'd come out of a uh, big band where there wasn't a lot of space uh, except for the solos, but we're talking about space in a different way, and Monk was the master of that. And rhythm and time and harmonic territory that was completely different from say a major big band like Dizzy's or, or Billy Eckstein's. Oh yeah, well Thelonious, uh, his, uh, he was such a, his compositions and the way Thelonious played was uh, like, he was an individual. He, uh, his composition was not like the regular normal comp compositions that you would hear, uh, you know, usually 
the uh, the uh, the writers will be writing uh, songs eight and eight and bridge and eight bar. Uh, Thelonious would think of a melody or something, and if the melody is four bars, that's the tune for him. Or if you think of a melody which consists of eight bars and then the bridge, instead of eight bars, the bridge is six bars or four bars, he leave it just like that because that's what he hear. So, and then that would, I think that made him sort of uh, different than a lot of composition. His composition was so personal and you would have to play what he wrote and how he felt it, otherwise it wouldn't, go off, it wouldn't come off if you try to interpret your way. And so his, uh, he was just such a, an individual, really. Well, here you are um, working, uh, you know, totally in a different context. And when you uh, first experienced playing, uh, you know, in the monk mold uh, and style, what did you have to do from the standpoint of, say, your horn, you as a human being, and how you think, and then how you breathe? <laughs> well, I would have, to, I had to adjust. But what happened? Uh, uh, I joined Thelonious in '59, uh, the latter part of '59. In fact, Johnny Griffin was uh, was in the band previous to that, and then uh, John Coltrane was before him. And Sonny was before our train. But uh, when Griffin went to Europe to stay, uh, I was happened to be, we were, I was, I think it was either I was in the village. I could have, I think it was in the village. I, I ran across uh, Sonny Rollins and he, he was saying that Rouse, uh, Thelonious was looking for you. Uh, I think uh, Griffin went to Europe and he wants you to, you know, to play with him. So right then I said, yeah. <laughs> so I, um, I said, well, good, I'll contact him. And then when I contact him, um, he said, well, man, I want you to be in the band. Come, uh, you know, can you come up to the house tomorrow? I say, sure. So when I got up there, we talked, and Thelonious was the type of person that uh, he didn't have too much to say. You know, he said, well, man, you want to be in the band, you know? I said, sure, I would like to be in the band. He said, well, solid, good. He said, uh, it's going to be a court, you know, I want uh, uh, Frankie Dunlap and, uh, no, it was uh, Arthur Taylor and Sam Jones was the other in the rhythm section. So he said, well, we're going to open up down the fire spot. Could you come to rehearsal uh, tomorrow night? I said, sure. I was saying, well, what time? I thought it would be around 8 or 9 o'clock. Say around 12 o'clock. So we re usually rehearse at start around 12 o'clock midnight until 8 and 9 o'clock in the morning over to his house or either over to the Baroness' house uh, practicing all night long. He would sit on the piano and learn me, uh, show me a tune. And then he saw that I knew the melody. Then he got up off the t uh, piano and walked around and had me play, and I would play it. So during the, the period of from 12 to 8 o'clock in the morning, I would learn maybe two tunes a night. So, but uh, it was very good doing it that way because uh, when you're uh, doing it that way, you learn the tune and once you learn it, it, you know, he'll learn you the melody and then he'll tell you to go ahead and play it and mess around with it. So he subbed you to go out of the, out on the, you know, he did not go out of the house, but he may go downstairs or be somewhere in the room, but he's still listening to what you're doing. And then when he see that you uh, got it under your hands, you know what you, you're doing, he come back and sit on the piano and say, okay, let's play it. And then we'll play it. But then it's in your head then. So he subject won't call the tune. Uh, we work, and I'm figuring that he'll call the tune the next night, and he won't call it maybe two weeks later. So, so, and then when, usually when you're playing with Thelonious, I, I don't think Thelonious know what, he don't have no set, uh, like a set music, you know, like uh, songs to play at each set. He start playing on the piano. I imagine you know when you saw him, you know, and then he strike up something come in his head and he start playing. And so you got to automatically, you got to know what he's doing so you can come in because he, he may play, state the melody for about two bars 
and then he'll play intro though and he's supposed to come right in so but that's all of a challenge that's why i like to you know uh, it it kept you on your toes that's uh, you know that's why i love to play with him yeah. well you had uh, really developed uh, your your knowledge and your skill prior to joining him and it was just uh, you had used the term adjustment uh, say uh, with the uh, term rhythm and and then harmonic uh, change. Oh yes, yeah. Well, to adjust the, to play with the Lawrence because uh, he wasn't like any other uh, composer, you know. So you had to adjust to play with him. You had to. Uh, uh, I give you for example, uh, Friday the Thirteenth. Is uh, the song is only consists of four chords. And it's only four bars. And that's keep repeating over and over again. So, I mean, uh, you have to really start thinking or being uh, creative because uh, playing that, uh, that, that particular phrase over and over again, I mean, what can you do? Uh, but if you, if you don't create any... Uh, any spark or any anything or spontaneous thing going, you're not going. It's going to drop on your head. You know, you're going to. It's going to drop. Everything is not going to come out right. So you have to keep uh, keep at it. Um, uh, he, I have to. I had to adjust to his, his music uh, because uh, it's plain like with Tad. I give you uh, for example, Tad Dameron was was a, one of our great composers too, uh, but his music was either 16 bars or 32 bars. With Thelonious music, uh, when you're playing his composition, his composition could be uh, uh, seven bars. Uh, maybe you play uh, eight bars in front and then you got a, a, a bridge that is seven bars or six bars. It's not the regular eight bar bridge. And so you have to really adjust to that because you, uh, it's, it's something new to you, you know? And uh, you feel funny, you know, on the stage, and you start playing, and then you s something happened, and you don't know where you are, or what's happening, and then you out there holding your horn and your mouth open. <laughs> and Thelonious was the type of musician where, and if you like that, he'll leave you out there, because he, when you're playing with him, he'll subject you to play with you for about four or five courses, and then he'd get off the piano and start walking around the stage. And you're out there with the bass and drums, and if you don't know what you're doing, you <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> Thank you very much, Charlie Rouse, for that picture of the learning experience uh, involved with that uh, legendary institution, Thelonious Monk. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Saturday afternoon. One of the most disciplined groups you'll ever find in jazz music. You know, called stage, and you're out there with the bass and drums, and if you don't know what you're doing, you <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> Thank you very much, Charlie Rouse, for that picture of the learning experience uh, involved with that uh, legendary institution, Thelonious Monk. Yes, thank you. <laughs> May 11th, 1985, Saturday afternoon, with some rather dark gray storm clouds rolling overhead. <laughs> Charlie Rouse, uh, we'll get out from under here, and uh, I... In a, another conversation about Monk, I got to thinking, here is this pianist, composer Thelonious Monk, who is breaking new territory. And preceding him as another legend and pioneer and giant by the name of Duke Ellington. And you had the great fortune of appearing with the Ellington Band over a period of time. Now, that was a totally different experience. and. The, the contrasting learning experience and life experience for you between Monk and Ellington is prompts this question. What is the question? Uh, what's the distinction between the two, and how do you sort of draw a picture of your Ellington experience? Well, 
I think they uh I can relate relate to both of them. Both of them uh you know like Duke is the master of uh you know uh I would say like Duke was the master and uh, Thelonious was uh the younger of the two and th uh, you had a lot of similarities there between uh Monk and Duke. I find I find it uh, in handling musicians, plus uh, I find that in um, similarity of how they play, how they voice their the, uh, the, uh, chords, their harmonic. Because um, uh, I know that Monk was very, very, very fond of Duke, you know? And I know that Duke was fond of Monk. They, they, they recognized each, you know? But Duke was like, he's the older, like the daddy of it. So I would have to say that Duke was the, you know, is the master. The Thelonious really, fed, uh, uh, I would say, Thelonious was listening to I mean, to Duke a lot because uh, that's the way I see it. Because uh, I think uh, Thelonious, what he did, he um, he made an album dedicated to 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 uh, Duke. But I can, I working with both of them. Uh, uh, Thelonious, the, the similarity was very close as far as the, the, the musical composition was concerned. Duke was very rhythmically. Duke could set a, a set tempos that would, uh, uh, would would make you pack your, your feet and clap your hands. It's the same way that Thelonious would do it. They, they had a, a knack, a, a uncanny thing about them where they can get a tempo and they want that tempo to be just the way they, I mean, for what composition that they are, are stomping off, it's just the right tempo for the composition, you know? And then uh, Duke is a master in that, and Monk is the master in that. And far as handling musicians, uh, it's, it's a similarity there, because Duke, I expect when you're on the bandstand, he wants you to do what you're supposed to, uh, your job. And once you get off the bandstand, uh, you are uh, you're on your own, and Thelonious was the same type of uh, musician. You had to play when you're on the bandstand, and once you're off the bandstand, you're, you know, he's not he's not like a lot of band a lot of uh, bands that you get into where they have a whole set of rules, and you have to uh, hear by you have to say well, you have to wear a tie and you have to do this. You know, they let you the uh, Duke and Monk, they let you do what you want. Uh, what you they, they give you that that privilege of uh, of making up your mind what you want to uh, if you're late well it's not about a fining but it's about uh, either you want to work in the band or you don't want to work in the band if it's, it's business if you want to be in the band you have to make your time and you have to play when you're on the bandstand now when you're off the bandstand you can do whatever you want to do and that's, uh, they are very closely uh, similar to like for the airplane. You know, that's how I, I judge both of them. From the standpoint of musical compositions, uh, your first impressions of that Duke Ellington book? Uh, the, first <laughs> the first impression of Duke Ellington book was, uh, was frightening too. <laughs> and, uh, and I was setting, uh, I, actually I took Ben Webster plays. And Ben was my idol at the time, but I was sitting next to Johnny Hodges and Proko and Jimmy Hamilton and Harry Connie, and I was uh, that was one of your that was one of the greatest read, uh, read section that I that if it, of any band that you can you know you can really say I don't know they just uh, it was it was a wealth of uh, learning there too with Duke Ellington a in a in a band setting, you know, and Thelonious it was in a quartet setting. I was, had a little more freedom playing and expressing myself, but in Duke's band you had the uh, privilege of playing with four giants next to you and blending with them and uh, the beauty of uh, the the band the hum the sound of the band the band. You could take the drummer, Sonny Greer used to be late and don't come to the band, and the band would hit, because uh, the way Duke uh, have it, Duke would, like we would play the theater, when the, when the, when the curtain come open, they would, uh, in Duke's band, you have a lot of stragglers, <laughs> you know, because he didn't, uh, 
he didn't you know he wasn't a strict uh like a band leader like a master you know so uh when the curtains uh getting ready to open now it could be five men in the band uh setting up on the stage when it's supposed to be 14. so but he didn't care when the curtain opened he uh, hit <laughs> you know and the, the whoever was on that bandstand he would improvise he would call you say you do this you do that you know why and then eventually before the tune is over the whole band is on the stand you know but he doesn't he don't wait and be panting say gee where's everybody you know if it's five